So one of the great things about partnership marketing is that um, there are not literally an infinite number of partners, but kind of figuratively infinite number of partners out there, right? There's an incredible variety of, of ways that this works. And uh, that's one of the reasons we think it's great because you can pick and choose based on all the different models, what works for your business and your brand. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Organize Chaos, a live version of the podcast today. So whether you're joining from LinkedIn, from YouTube, watching this on the podcast after the fact, uh, or just uh, tuning in accidentally for the first time, welcome to the Organize Chaos show. We normally do these as a five day a week show, but we've just started doing these live episodes because we realize we've got so many guests that can just hop on and bring value. And really, we don't have to edit much of what they say. And so we thought, why not jump on here live and be available for a live Q&A, and that's what we're going to get into today. Today's episode is going to be all about partnership marketing and why small businesses in particular should utilize partner marketing as part of their marketing mix, just like other channels like paid social or search. So we're going to have a special partner, Matt Wool, jump on. Matt is the CEO of Acceleration Partners, which is a marketing agency that helps industry-leading brands efficiently grow and refine their affiliate marketing marketing partnerships. And they've built partnerships with brands you've definitely heard of. Clients like Adidas, Hotwire, LinkedIn, Redbubble, Reebok, StubHub. But before I let Matt in, I just want to let you all know, if you have questions, live questions, please type them in the chat, ask questions throughout, because one of the benefits of doing this as a live show is that we can live react to what you are interpreting from the conversation and we can live answer your questions. So please be interactive, put your questions in the chat. And with that, I'm going to invite in Matt Wool. Hey, Chris. Hey, Matt. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Great to be here. All right. So uh, before we dig into your story and, and partnership marketing, why don't you just tell us really quickly, what is Acceleration Partners? Yeah. Acceleration Partners is the largest partnership marketing agency in the world. Uh, we do really one thing, which is partnership marketing. We don't do SEO or paid search or, or other pieces of the, of the digital marketing world. Um, as you mentioned, we do a lot of affiliate programs. We also do influencer marketing. Um, and we work across B2C, B2B uh, on a global basis. Okay, so we have a ton to talk about because mm -hmm. I think one of the things that a lot of growing businesses are still trying to figure out is the right mix of marketing channels and how they yeah. get business. And so we're going to dig into that pretty deeply. Um, but first, you've been with the company for several years from when they were mm -hmm. four employees. Is that right? Yeah. So I started uh, over 10 years ago. We had four people at that time. Uh, and I've, I've pretty much seen every stage of growth. I started as the VP of client services. Uh, then I became general manager. Then I became president. Uh, and last year I became CEO. Uh, I've kind of a weird path. Uh, I actually started my career in the movie industry, did that for a bunch of years, and then through some twists and turns, ended up in, uh, in digital marketing. So it's interesting because now working with partners and influencers and that you kind of mm -hmm. understand the the uh, the value of those celebrity things that you probably mm -hmm. encountered in the movie days, right? Absolutely. There's, it, I was on another podcast a couple weeks ago and we actually pulled a lot of parallels out that I hadn't even considered. It's It's really interesting. So any major takeaways from that conversation that you want to start with here? Um, I think the, the, the biggest one was honestly the value of relationships. Um, the, the movie industry is an industry that is really predicated on relationships in a way that I think few are. And so I think that, that's the biggest parallel. Whenever we're talking about partnership marketing, um, it, it's all about relationships. And you know we'll, we'll probably get into this later, but it's not something you can do with an algorithm uh, you know, entirely. Obviously, there's ways you can enable with technology, but uh, it's always about talking to a person. And uh, I think that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, those those key relationships can be such a differentiator mm -hmm. and open up opportunities. And so finding yeah. those relationships is crucial. And I assume that's kind of what you help do is is cultivate those relationships for brands, right? Yeah, so we, we uh, find partners, we bring them into programs, we uh, optimize them. And, you know, as programs scale, there's just a lot of operational stuff that has to happen. There's regulatory stuff that has to happen. There's reporting. So, um, you know, obviously finding and working with the partners directly is the most important thing. But there is a lot of back office work that also sure. has to get done to make sure it, it works right. 
Sure. And so, and so you said that you're the largest in the world. And so for context, yes. for our listeners, how, how big is the team now? You grew from four people to... Yep. We have 300 all around the world uh, at this point, about two thirds in the US and one third uh, across Europe, Latin America, and uh, Asia Pacific. Wow, congrats, that's amazing. And Thank for you. you in particular, you started mm -hmm. off as a VP role and grew into the CEO role. There is a founder, mm -hmm. right? Is he actively involved in the business? Yes, we have a founder. Uh, he was our CEO for, for a long time. Uh, he is now the chairman of our board. So he's uh, very involved in the business. I think one of the things that, that we discovered over time is that uh, you know, when when you have a, a really visionary entrepreneur, they add a, a ton of value, and then as the company grows, you know what they need out of the business and and what they you know what they're really good at starts to change vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know how the business is developing. So you know he decided that he wanted to focus on the parts of the business that he really enjoyed and uh, leave more of the operational stuff to uh, to me and the leadership team. I love that. Well, that's great self-awareness on his part. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that our listeners can take away as well to figure out really what their role in the business is and then bring on the right executive team to help grow what they're doing. Absolutely. So yep. let's get into partnership marketing. How does this differ from just any other digital marketing or marketing channels? Yeah, it differs uh, a lot. And the, the, the biggest way that it differs it is that again, it is about relationships and it's about connecting uh, with, at the end of the day, people. Um, we'll, I'll come back to this theme a lot uh, probably today, but um, when you are doing uh, paid search or marketing with Facebook or Instagram, you know, there's obviously a lot of strategy that goes into it, there's a lot going on. But at the end of the day, you are dealing with a platform and an algorithm. Uh, and, and that platform and that algorithm are setting the price. Uh, Google tells you what a click is going to cost or what an impression is going to cost. Facebook and Instagram tell you what, what those things are going to cost. In uh, partnership marketing, you are working with people. You are building relationships. You are trying to scale them the best you can. Um, and what is really different uh, about that is that you, as the advertiser, are actually the one that usually sets the price. You get to say, I want to pay my partners X. And uh, it, it's so, so it becomes a very different model. And it, it, it changes the dynamics of the industry really significantly. Now, that's not to say there isn't um, negotiation or there aren't times where, where a partner might say, hey, you know, I'm only going to work with you if you pay me why. But at the end of the day, it is not about a black box that is just dictating what, what, what a price is going to be. It's about uh, you figuring out what works for your business and then working for partners with partners in a win-win way. So in regular paid social or paid search, mm -hmm. there is a cost for the impressions. That's what the yeah. algorithm is kind of figuring out. You put yeah. a certain amount of budget toward it and then you get yeah. whatever exposure. And so by working with a partner, in this case, like an influencer or some kind of you know person with yeah. a, a following, it, are you taking advantage of their organic following to get that reach? Is that what you're saying? That you would form a relationship with that partner and then they would kind of organically post? So uh, honestly, uh, it, it can be that, or it, it takes a, 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 a million different flavors, right? So one of the great things about partnership marketing is that um, there are not literally an infinite number of partners, but kind of figuratively infinite number of partners out there, right? And they range from, you know, influencers on TikTok to, uh, you know, old school bloggers to um, huge businesses like Honey, uh, or uh, uh, Rakuten Loyalty, or um, uh, Retail Me Not, right? And then it ranges to folks like, you know, CNN, right? Or the New York Times. So they all have different models. They all work differently. Um, there is organic reach. Some of them arbitrage, right? They go out and buy their own media. So for example, if I sometimes, uh, you know, we'll go to a partner and we'll say, we'll pay you $10 for every new customer you send us. And that uh, uh, partner might say, well, then I'm going to go buy my own media. And if I can, you know, for $7, bring in that customer, and then you pay me $10, then I'm, I'm making the spread. There, there's, there's an incredible variety of, of ways that this works. And uh, that's one of the reasons we think it's great, because you can pick and choose based on all the different models, what works for your business and your brand. That's interesting. So I, I love that specific example. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to 
you know, use the context of what we've done as a business because yeah. that's really my only background here. And so we have an affiliate program uh, where we've done revenue share kind of deals with people. And mm -hmm. some of those yeah. affiliates have, like you mentioned, found a way to do paid media in really narrow markets where we're not yeah. touching those markets. And then they make a commission on the signups that they get through those markets. So that would be like an arbitrage example, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and that's a great and, example. That happens all the time. That's great. Okay. And then, and then we've had other influencer types where uh, like, like a TikTok influencer, mm -hmm. where we say, we're just going to pay you this fixed fee to put out so much creative and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, hope that it goes viral and gets picked up because a lot of your other stuff gets picked up. So we've done yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but here, but this is a key thing, right? We would argue that that second one isn't true, isn't really truly partnership marketing unless you know the outcome that comes from that. Right. Okay. So for us, right, the definition of partnership marketing is that you are working with partners on some kind of way where the outcome is being connected to the to the input. Right. And so that doesn't mean you're always paying directly on performance. It doesn't mean you're paying, you know, a rev share. You might be paying someone a flat fee up front, but that you 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 know, you really have some indication of, hey, I paid this, you know, influencer five thousand dollars, and I and I know what I got for that. So, like, we would argue honestly that you know, if you go out and pay Kim Kardashian whatever to post on Instagram, and you have no idea what that actually does for you, that you know, that is a partnership, but it kind of doesn't fit into what we would call partnership marketing in the way we define it. So it's a little ambiguous because a lot of the, yeah. the attribution is hard to nail down. And so I'll give yes. you another example. For instance, yeah. we have a endorsement, a kind of partnership we did with Montel Jordan, the singer that's yeah. saying that this is how we do it. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and we produced a, a, a different song with him. It's been added to like 50,000 Spotify playlists yeah. and it's, you know, it's gotten out there and we don't really necessarily know that, you know, because someone heard him talk about Trainual in the song yeah. or saw him wear the t-shirt in the music video, they came to us. And, and right. so it's just kind of like a, 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 a prayer almost. <laughs> that yeah. We yeah. So, so, so that we would put as like a brand partnership, right? We, we, okay. we would, and look, obviously it's a little bit arbitrary, but that's how like we would, we would approach that kind of a deal. Um, so, okay. so, so that's not partnership. necessarily the kind of deal that we, that, that, that we would be focused on. But if, if we said, you know, if you had connected somehow, you know, Montel Jordan uh, to, you know, an affiliate platform where you could track clicks that came from the songs, then 100 percent. Right. And then you would know exactly what happened. Um, and I'll give you actually a really good example. So um, everyone knows about the Coinbase ad uh, of the Super Bowl. Right. Yeah. With, with the QR code. Right. So historically, you, you did a Super Bowl ad and you didn't you, you really didn't know exactly what that did for you, right? You were basically spending $5 million and assuming that something good was going to happen, right? right. Um, and that was, kind of, you know, it's a brand thing, you know, avocados from Mexico or whatever. With the Coinbase, like, because it was a QR code, now they actually knew exactly what was going to come out of that, right? Yeah. And, and so you could almost imagine a world where, like, an advertising agency would say, we're going to go and, like, arbitrage a Super Bowl ad <laughs> with a QR code, right? And we're going to put up $5 million and Coinbase is going to pay us for every customer that comes through, right? And, and that's how we're going to make money. So like, that's kind of the difference, right? They, they like, it, it's more that, that it's tied to the outcome in that case. And it's hyper trackable. I mean, a QR yes. code it probably doesn't get yeah. any more trackable than that. It's really exactly. hard to have uh, you know, URLs that people visit when, you know, when they see a billboard or, or something yeah, like that. You that's know, right. and, and so I think it is getting a little easier. Are there other ways other than QR codes to really make things trackable in a physical world? Yeah. So, well, I mean, when you get into out of home and stuff, it's obviously, it's obviously very difficult. Well, there's more and more that's happening uh, in that world. But, you know, for us and for, for most partnership marketing is driven by uh, uh, what we call, uh, you know, affiliate or partnership platforms, um, that that are essentially tracking everything in our our uh, there's a lot of different technologies, but but that's really the rails that it's all run on. Okay, so for anyone listening, if they haven't set up any kind of affiliate program, mm -hmm. affiliate marketing, um, where do they even start? Is there a, a yep. way that they can get educated on this? Is there a simple do-it-yourself kind of platform that you say is a yep. good first step for people? Yeah, so um, there's there's a couple of things. So so first of all, if you go to uh, our website accelerationpartners.com, there's tons of of content, and people can can check it out there. Um, you know, I think for a for a smaller business, 
um, what they have to think about is that there, there's two components, okay? There's the technical component, uh, of actually, you know, tracking what's going on and making payments to partners and that kind of stuff uh, and, and, and reporting. And then there's the actual, how do we do it, right? How do we go out and find partners and work with them, right? Th those are two separate components. And, um, you know, and, and much like if you're doing paid search, you might, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have your Facebook account or your Google account, but you'll maybe hire an agency to run your you know, paid to, to run the paid search or run the Facebook. Um, that's how it works in our industry too, right? So you set up on a, on a technology, that technology is what is underpinning everything. Uh, but then you, 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 either you have to do it yourself in terms of building the relationships and managing them, or you bring in an agency. So from the technical side, um, there's a few different options. So historically, there's been a, a set of technologies that are, have been more enterprise focused um, and that have lots of whiz bang and are more expensive. Uh, and, and we've advised small uh, businesses to kind of stay away from those. Um, those include folks like Impact uh, or AWIN. Those are kind of big names uh, in, in, that, in that world. Um, uh, then there's a, another group, uh, folks like Refersion, for example, that really specialize, or, or Everflow is another one, that specialize generally in working with smaller businesses. They, they simplify things. They have pretty easy ways to get set up and pay. Um, so, so in the old days, we would say you go to one of the ones that are really focused on, on the on smaller businesses, right, that have lower barriers to entry. Over time, what's happened is these bigger platforms have realized that there's a huge market in the small business world. And so now they've created versions of their products that work with, uh, with small businesses. So, for example, Impact, which we work on with brands like Target, for example, um, they have done an integration with Shopify. And basically, if you're on Shopify, which probably a lot of people who are listening to this are, um, you, with one click, you can set up an impact uh, uh, account, you're integrated, mm -hmm. and you're basically ready to go with kind of a, a stripped down version of their product that, that works for small business. Um, AWIN has a product uh, called AWIN Access. It's similar, not integrated with Shopify in the same way, but similar, like very easy, low barrier entry. Uh, there's another one called Share a Sale, which AWIN owns. It's kind of targeting the smaller market. So there's lots of these options on the technical side where you can now really easily go and just get set up, right? But that's only half of it because that's like the nuts and bolts, right? right. Um, so then you have to figure out the other side of it, which is what do you do? So, you know, on that side, what we really recommend is that uh, businesses that are new to this and smaller businesses, um, they start small. Um, like anything, you know, you're, you're not going to flip a switch and all of a sudden have, you know, a massive <laughs> program. It's not automatic like that. Right. But, you know, unlike Google or Facebook, like with Google or Facebook, you can go and you can say, look, here's my budget. It's $50,000. And all of a sudden you're basically scaled, right? They'll take all your money and they'll buy as many ads as you can get with that. Right. But in this world, because it's about partnerships, it's a ground game. And especially if people aren't sure who you are, you know, it's about you're going to have to identify them. You're going to have to go out and call them. You're going to have to say, hey, this is my brand. This is what I'm doing. Uh, this is why I think we'd be a great partnership. It's like any business development, right? Here's kind of how the economics are set up. Um, so we just recommend that that brand start small. They identify a small handful of partners they can work with, um, focus on those, and, and go for quality over quantity, build a few deep relationships, and then over time, scale them. That tends to really work the best. I have so many questions about this, but Nadia in the yeah. chat has a great question. Uh, do you think affiliate marketing will eventually dominate the digital marketing space over other channels? And so <laughs> while you're thinking about that, you know, th I think, you know, with with the privacy laws and the, the cookies and everything mm -hmm. that's been changing to try to get cold traffic, uh, the intermediaries or these partners mm -hmm. become even more important. And so can you see a future where affiliate marketing is the dominant strategy? Yeah, I, I don't know if I see a future where it's the dominant strategy, um, and the reason for that is that it does take time, uh, and it take you know, and, and it and it it takes a while to scale, right? So I think it I, I see it is it has been over the last number of years been getting more and more prominent, and I think that will continue. But I it, I don't want to go out and claim that it replaces running Instagram campaigns, right? It it doesn't replace that. It it is different. But yeah. the way that we think about it is like. Um, you know, if, if you have a stock portfolio, you know, your retirement fund, like you don't want to put all your retirement money in one stock, right? But we have so many brands right now that are basically putting all their money into like one marketing channel. Uh, 
Um, we, we look at partnerships as like a basket of mutual funds, right? You can go out and you can find 10, 20, 100, you know, you can run them through the same, you know, through, through one program, but, you know, they're all doing their own thing. They're all out there, you know, with the promoting in different ways. And so it diversifies everything and it, it also just gets you out of that risk of, hey, you know, all of a sudden Facebook's, you know, rates went up 40%, which is which has been happening. So we don't want to claim that it's going to take over everything else because I, I don't think that's realistic. Um, but it has definitely been increasing in importance. So we see brands with bigger and bigger shares of their revenue coming from from the channels. And from the individual standpoint, the person with the audience, I think more than ever, this affiliate marketing has become a way to finance their lifestyle or whatever yep. they want to do, where they don't have to do services work or something. They can just put out good content and finance yep. that in a way like never before. So, you know, in, in affiliate programs, one thing that I've seen, um, maybe maybe this is common, is you, you get a ton of affiliates. I think we have thousands of affiliates, mm -hmm. but then... 5% of them do generate everything, you know, yeah. and most people that sign up don't, don't move the needle, uh, don't right. even get, get one sale. Is that pretty common? So uh, it is common when the program is um, under resource, <laughs> right? And I don't, I don't want to cast aspersions on your program. No, 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 but, that's my next question. So it's, yeah, but, but, but the reality is, is again, like, because this is relationships, like it takes work. And so what happens is, Someone sees your program like, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to sign up. Right. And then maybe they get an email from you every couple of weeks saying, hey, this is what's going on. But like there's not really that relationship and there's no one calling them saying, hey, like this is what we're doing. And, you know, this is why it's exciting. And here's some assets that you can use. And, you know, how can we figure out what to do? Like so, so that's typically what happens. Right. So um, I think that's really common, again, in, in, in places where uh, there's, you know, a person spending 20 percent of their time on the program. Um, so that's where that's where an agency can help. But it's also, frankly, why I said before, like start small, right? So if you have a thousand publishers, but only 5% of them are being active, like you're probably better off having 50 publishers and getting most of them active, right? And getting more out of them. Uh, that tends to be how the math works. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And so almost uh, almost just making cuts in the program and saying that we're, we're starting yep. over. And if you've had uh, any engagement in the last right. year, then you're, you're, you're default in and everybody else has to reapply something like that. Yeah, exactly. And it may be that some of the ones who applied weren't even good fits. Right. And it may be that some, you know, that someone just kind of was hitting a accept, accept, accept and, and they weren't really alive. So if someone's doing this themselves and they do want to put a lot of resources into this, or if they're working mm -hmm. with an agency like yours, what are some yeah. of the sweet, uh, the, the, the sweet spots of engagement? Like how frequently should they be yeah. engaging, building these relationships? And maybe what are some tactics to do that? Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, most people hate this answer, but it depends. Um, like there are some partnerships that are so fruitful that you want to be talking to them every week, right. Or even multiple times a week. Right. Um, and it also depends on your business model, right? Like for example, you know, we've had brands that are introducing new products, you know, almost daily, right? And in that case, you need to be, you know, really connected to publishers so they know what's going on and which products are going to work for them and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think in generally, in general, um, if you're connecting with a publisher, you know, uh, uh, every couple of weeks, um, that's good. Uh, you know, they don't, again, like if, if, if they're not getting value from it, they're not going to want to spend the time to talk with you. Right. So it's about bringing them value. And, uh, and frankly, we find that like making their life as easy as you can tends to work really well. Right. So it's like, Hey, we've pre-written this thing. <laughs> right. right. And they, now you can go take it and you can put it in your own voice. Right. But at least you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, or here's a bunch of, uh, of assets or, you know, here's a campaign idea. So, so I think the, the more that you can bring to them, uh, uh, the better. Uh, it just makes their life easier. And what you have to remember is that like these publishers, you know, they're, they're in some ways they're like grocery stores, like they have shelf space and they can only promote a certain number of, 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 of partners, you know, brands. And so um, they're going to want to promote the ones that are uh, best aligned with them and, and bringing them the best stuff. So uh, another tactic that works really well is, you know, exclusives, right. Or, so if you've got a really great partner and you say, hey, we're going to create a, you know, a 10% off discount that's only coming from you, right? So they can push that to their users. That gets them additional value. Um, if we're going to give your, you, know, you an early look at a new thing that we're doing or you know, anything like that is, is incredibly helpful because it just adds to the relationship. Okay. A, a question that may be a little bit um, 
maybe scarcity minded instead of yeah. instead of abundance thinking. But I've heard people say that, you know, why would I give a partner a cut of this when mm-hmm. I might make that sale anyway? I could make that, I yeah. could reach that customer anyway. And so yes. what do you say to that perspective? Yeah. So I would say that, uh, you know, we call this the incrementality question, right? And I would say that uh, there is uh, probably no one who has actually solved this problem, <laughs> right? Even like the giant companies that we work at have not solved this problem. So uh, the, yes, you do not want to just to pay someone if you were going to get that sale anyway, uh, without their interaction. However, th- what it comes down to is figuring that out, right? And, and, how, and how do you figure that out? Um, I think when you're dealing with a lot of it comes down to the business model of the site. Um, you know, in our experience, if there are sites that are simply throwing out discount codes, for example, with no context or content or anything, um, the incrementality of that tends to be relatively low because what that means usually is that someone is doing a Google search for the thing they already want to buy and they're just looking for, for, for the discount code. Right. Um, but if you're working with a, you know, content-based site that has a big audience that's really aligned with what you're doing, um, and you're, you know, a, a relatively small brand with relatively little, you know, market penetration. Um, the chance that that the audience member who is coming through them was going to buy from you anyway is probably not that high, right? So I think, uh, you know, over time you can get into, you know, analytics platforms and Adobe and all the complicated stuff. But as a small business, I, the eighty twenty. Is, is often enough where you can just look at what that publisher is doing and, and how they relate to you and you can make some decisions. But the thing to remember is a lot of times it's not whether you work with them, it's how. It's not if, it's how, right? So you can go to one publisher and you can say, look, I don't think you're quite as incremental for us. So we're going to pay you a 2% rev share. And you can go to the other publisher and say, I think you're super incremental. So I'm going to pay you a 15% rev share, right? Um, it, it doesn't have to be the same for, for everybody. And and that's a lot of what we do is really figure out like where's the value for different publishers and, and, and how do we how do we set the price? I love that way of thinking about it. So you can pay different rates based on someone's content and their alignment and how likely yeah. they are to reach a different customer. And and uh, and just having that discussion, I think, is probably easier to do when you're working more directly with those partners instead Definitely. of very hands off automated sign up kind of process. Absolutely. So, yes. So again, for my for my smaller business folks that are that are watching, um, you know, when they're getting started and just trying to figure out their stock portfolio, like you said, of where they're going to mm-hmm. put their attention or or their budget, um, when is there a a right time that you think they should start introducing the the uh, an affiliate or partner marketing strategy? Yeah, so um, I think the the right time is when they have uh, a well functioning website. Uh, that is converting reasonably well. And the reason that I say that is there's nothing that publishers and partners hate more than sending lots of traffic that doesn't convert, right? So, so making sure that your site is kind of, you know, set up well uh, is, is a prerequisite. Making sure that you are, are really clear on your, you know, product and, and, and product market fit, right? So that you're going to the partners with a really good story that's not changing every week, right? If you're pivoting all the time, that's going to be really hard for, for, for a partner to keep up with. Um, and then I, I would say, you know, having some level of, of brand recognition, right? So obviously you don't need to be out there, you know, in the world, uh, you know, like, you know, Target or something, but uh, you, you, you need to, you know, have, have something where you can go to a, a partner and say, this is who we are you know, this is what we're doing. This is where we've been. And ideally, you know, at least some, some case studies of traction that you've gained elsewhere. So at a minimum, those are the things that I would say you want to do before you start going out to partners. Yeah, I, I, I think that's great. I'm, I'm taking all these notes for myself. So hopefully everybody's listening is taking those, those notes too. But yeah, I remember in the early days when we first launched our affiliate program and we had people sending traffic to the website and, you know, they, they could see their stats and they'd mm-hmm. say, well, a hundred people clicked the link and no one signed up. So how, like, how many do I have to send before I'm going to get a right. sign up? That's exactly it. And you, like, back to my earlier analogy, like, you know, they've got limited shelf space. And if you're a grocery store, if people are walking by, you know, the display and they're not buying anything, then you're, that display's not going to be there that long, right? So uh, yeah. that, that's how it works in this too. So we've talked a lot about affiliate programs, but I know mm-hmm. partnership marketing is, is broader than, than just that. And mm-hmm. so what other examples would you pull for types of partnerships that people might consider? 
Yeah. So uh, influencer is obviously a big one. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of different flavors of influencers. So as I had said before, um, uh, you know, we focus on, on influencer uh, programs that are, are connected to outcomes in some way. Uh, and there's a whole other set of, you know, tools and technology that goes along with influencer as opposed to affiliate. You know, there's Creator IQ and Activate and Isaiah and Grin, right? Whaler. There's this whole other uh, technology set around, um, you know, discovery and, and campaign management and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, so influencer is definitely a, a big one. And then there's this kind of, you know, newer category of that are more kind of technology based, um, uh, uh, you know, companies that work on, on a performance basis, but aren't necessarily like directly in affiliate programs. So, uh, you know, there's, um, there's a company called button, for example, right. And they do like deep integration with apps. So, you know, if you're, uh, Uber, right. You can partner like with a deep integration to, you know, open table, for example, right. So if someone goes an open table, they make a, a reserve, you know, a reservation. And then a little button pops up and says like, do you need an Uber to get to your reservation? Right. And that's connecting Uber and, and, and open table and they pay each other on a partnership basis. Um, there's a company called Cardlytics and there's a bunch of these other companies that do um, what are called card linked offers. So they're literally like connected to your credit card and then they can give you offers based on your spending history. And when you use the credit card, you actually get like statement credits back. <laughs> right. As, as Is that a, how that works? Yeah every, yeah. every time I log into Amex, I'm like, oh, I just yeah. shopped in these five places. Why yeah. do I have discounts now? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So there's, you know, so, so there's, there's all this stuff and, and uh, a lot of it, you know, like the credit, the, the card linked offers, right. It's so much about understanding you personally, so they can serve you an offer that is contextual that you'd want, right. As opposed to just throwing up a, a display ad. So th- there's a lot going on, uh, you know, in, in this whole space and, and especially as, you know, programmatic, um, continues to, to struggle, I think with a lot, you know, a lot of ways, um, more and more companies are pivoting to this model because they, they see it as the future. So another tech oriented question, but Joe mm-hmm. in the chat was building on your Super Bowl QR code example. Yeah. And he says, are there specific resources to research in home or out of home technology enablers to help capture or drive more measured outcomes? So, so similar to a QR code, are there other things yeah. you'd recommend to be able to capture in home, out of home uh, traffic, I guess, and, and attribute it. Yeah. So it, it's really hard. I mean, QR codes are really the, the way that most people are doing it these days. Um, I mean, th- there are some advanced technologies, for example, a lot of like the, the connected TV OTV, uh, platforms, you know, they're able to triangulate based on your mobile device and what you're watching and your IP address that you're you, even though you're not like connected, you know, even though you're not clicking on a link on, on the TV, for example. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's like a pretty deep, um, you know, technical solve. So there aren't a lot of other great solutions, uh, be, you know, th- that aren't super technically in- intensive, unfortunately. I remember back when I was, uh, my consulting business before this, mm-hmm. I had a, a client that had a business in the Dominican Republic and this was like 2012 mm-hmm. and I was so hyped on QR codes. You know, there was really yeah. no way to like scan them with your phone at that point. You needed to download yeah. a separate app. Um, but I, I was advising them that they should do a full building wrap. They had this big building in, in, the, in, the, in the TR. That's a great idea. Yeah. And I thought everybody going down the highway is going to wonder yeah. what the heck is that thing and scan it. Now, that was probably a bad idea 10 years ago, but right now I would say that's a... The- I mean, look, it, 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 it's, it's about timing, right? You know, QR codes died and all of a sudden, you know, they are back with a vengeance. Uh, and I think it's pretty interesting. But look, they're, they're good technology and they're easy. And I think that, that's, the, that's the reality of it. All right. So as we wrap this up, I want to touch on the future future of what this Mm -hmm. could look like, because one of the topics I've been digging into and trying to get educated on is everything related to, you know, augmented reality and NFTs. And, you know, I I think that there's a lot of opportunity there for partners to, you know, have smart contracts and things. So so when you think about your world and, and, and where your business fits in here, what's on your mind? What do you think's coming? Yeah, so uh, this is definitely on our mind. We actually have a working group internally at the company on Web3 and understanding, you know, kind of where things are going to be going. Um, you know, smart contracts and, and publishers, I think I'm not, I'm still not exactly sure where that goes, although it certainly could. 
But I think the, the bigger thing is like you can imagine in the metaverse, right? Uh, the difference is you actually could click on a billboard, right? Which is totally different than, than the real world. So right. literally everything becomes a opportunity for, for, for partnership marketing, right? In that, in that context. So um, I think we, we have no doubt that partnership marketing will be massive part of the Web3 and, and metaverse kind of world. I think it's so early. I, I don't want to make prognostications on, on, on what that really means yet. But uh, you don't want to be on the record. Is that yeah, what you're <laughs> I, 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 the reality is that, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm getting on and, and I leave it to the younger folks to understand <laughs> all this stuff. But, you know, I, uh, I, I, I'm not the smartest uh, when it comes to, 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 the, to these pieces. So, but what I would say is that, um, yeah, I, I, we have no doubt that it is going to be uh, a huge part of it. But I don't think we're ready to lay down our chips and say, like, this is where it's really going to focus. But as a general matter, again, like the idea of you can click on anything walking around, uh, it just is, is, you know, the biggest opportunity probably ever. It's infinitely more trackable. I, mer I, I, yeah. I remember when I was a little kid and my mom would have these like, you know, Pampered Chef or Tupperware kind yeah. of parties and invite all the neighborhood friends over and get a cut of whatever they bought. And that was a model. I don't know if they, if people yeah. still do that. But yeah. you think in the metaverse, you know, imagine a, a, a performer puts on a concert and everybody that was in attendance is getting now tagged yeah. for, for different offers that are brands that would align with them. And for so them, right. It's, and, and, and that kind of stuff is a lot harder to do in a in a physical world where we're just trying to track people's you know IP address for the free internet they signed on exactly. with or something like yeah. that. So or or just like you know your you know your avatar is wearing something cool and someone comes by and says I like that and you could you know basically buy it you know copy it from them and they get paid a commission right I mean Boom. all of a yeah, sudden there it is right and there, there yeah. you are That's it's, fun to it's think amazing about. right. Yeah. Well, um, I want to just remind everyone, if you have questions, put them in the chat, but otherwise we're going to start to wrap this up. So questions, any questions for Matt, put them in the chat about partnership marketing, about affiliates, any burning things that you want to know. But Matt, while we're waiting to see if there's any more, um, tell us about your book. You've got a book that just recently yes. came out, Moving to uh, Outcomes. Sh uh, why shameless plug right there. there. It is. Why <laughs> yes. partnership for the future of marketing. So you got it. Uh, yes. So this is uh, you, you and, and, uh, and the founder of the company put this together. Uh, what could people expect from the book? Yeah, so this is actually a sequel to a book that we wrote a few years ago called Performance Partnerships that kind of laid out the, the our early thinking on the evolution of this industry. Um, and this is kind of, you know, taking it to the next step. And we talk a lot about this concept of diversification in your marketing portfolio and uh, and how brands can you know instead of paying upfront for pretty much all their marketing they can they, they can pay on the outcome which is dramatically less risky so it's all about risk mitigation uh and, and finding new growth areas perfect well i think that's something that everyone could uh could probably benefit from so check out matt's book wherever books are sold uh amazon and airports he was just telling me there's you know where you live. They're, they're popping up in airports now that we're flying again so um, Matt, amazing talking with you. Thanks so much for sharing. I appreciate you coming on. Where can people connect with you? Yep, uh, www.accelerationpartners.com uh, is the best place to be. And uh, maybe at some point I'll get dragged into the metaverse and I'll see you there. <laughs> All right. Take a, a, a just do, can't wait to see your avatar and what you look like in the metaverse. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt, for coming on the live stream. And thank you, everyone else, for joining. This is fun. I'm really liking these live streams. Hey, thanks for listening to Organized Chaos. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, or share it with anyone in your network that you think could benefit from this information. For episode show notes, podcast recaps, and tons of other small business news and inspiration, check out the manual. That's trainual.com backslash manual.